Hello and welcome to Investigator Insights targeting CMET receptor as a strategy for treating cancer. So these Investigator Insights programs are designed to give us an opportunity to sit down with clinical investigators who are intimately involved in all of the clinical trials and research with novel emerging agents in a particular area. And we're gonna break this program down into three parts. Initially, talking about CMET and its ligand and just what its function is in the normal cell and how it becomes involved in malignancy. We'll go on in the second part and talk about the early clinical trials, phase one and phase two trials, some of which are completed, some ongoing, and then move on in section three to talk about the future and ongoing phase three trials and where our experts see CMET targeted agents moving into our therapeutic platforms. So joining me uh, for this session is Dr. Uh, Johanna Bendel and Dr. David Spiegel, uh, both from the Sarah Cannon Research Institute. So welcome to both of you. Thanks so much for coming in today. Yeah, thanks for having us. Well, this, this CMET is, is very interesting. I mean, I think most community oncologists are very familiar with receptor tyrosine kinases like uh, EGFR and HER2 and VEGFR, but CMET has sort of been sneaking up on us. So David, tell us a little bit uh, of an overview about uh, the CMET receptor and its ligand and what its role is in, in the normal cell. Well, yeah, I think it has been complicated because there does seem to be this traffic jam of signaling pathways in oncology and what's important now maybe didn't seem to be so important yesterday. It's true that EGFR, uh, the, the whole EGFR family, HER2, EGFR, have been, have been kind of the big stories, I think, certainly in breast cancer and lung cancer, uh, among other cancers. Uh, the, the MET receptor pathway has actually been well described now for many years. I think what's changed, <clears throat> changed recently has been the development of uh, new drugs that target this pathway. We know that this receptor is, is present in a number of epithelial tumors, including uh, non-small cell lung cancer, actually small cell lung cancer. I know Johanna will talk in a moment about the GI malignancies. We know this is common in head and neck cancers. Uh, this is probably a pathway that's not been exploited or, or investigated enough, but certainly, as you've, you've alluded to, a, a number of drugs are in development to start to target this pathway. We know that this, uh, this receptor, the, the CMET receptor, um, is important in tumor genesis. We know that activation of this receptor can occur many ways. It, uh, it can be stimulated excuse me, by its ligand, which is known as HGF, or um, sometimes referred to as scatter factor or hepatocyte growth factor. It's the ligand to this receptor, and we know that if you have overproduction of this ligand, that can lead to overstimulation of this, uh, of this pathway. We know that the receptor itself can be, um, be altered or amplified because of genomic uh, alterations. We know that there rarely can be even mutations in this receptor that lead to its activation. So there are many ways that this receptor or this pathway can be activated. And, and like most receptor uh, kinase pathways, it's the downstream effects that lead to all the hallmarks of oncogenesis. So um, uh, uh, the ability to spread within the microenvironment throughout the systemic circulation. Actually, there's been links to MET activation and angiogenesis. Um, so trying to turn this pathway off, uh, like I talk to patients, turning this switch off could be important in in uh, causing tumors to die. Right, so we know, Joanna, we know in, in, um, in EGFR, it seems to be the mutation that is the key, especially in certain non-small cell lung cancers. Um, and uh, KRAS is a, you know, another mutation that is important. But in CMET, uh, as David said, mutation doesn't seem to be the key oncogenic uh, factor. It's more uh, gene amplification or our protein overexpression. How how common is this seen in in GI malignancies, and what what sort of effect does this have? Um, does this lead to constitutive activation of the receptor, uh, and is there much in the way of crosstalk between CMET and and a number of the other receptors we've already mentioned? 
Well, what's really interesting about CMET is um, it can be activated, as you were saying, in multiple different ways, and you can tell that in different tumor types, it tends to be activated in specific ways in different tumor types. And so you can get this um, increase or um, constitutive activation of the kinase within CMET, so that means the inner part of the receptor just keeps sending signals no matter what happens. And those signals are sent down the PI3 kinase pathway, down the ras raf mech pathway, so we know that they're, it activates certain pathways within the cell that we're now becoming familiar with in the treatment of cancers. We've also seen increased receptor expression um, across the cell surface. We've also seen what's interesting about the CMET is that there seems to be a very uh, key play between CMET activation on the tumor cell and the microenvironment of the tumor itself. And so we've talked a lot, and you might hear a lot about this stromal tumor interaction. And what we're starting to focus on a lot now within cancer therapy is how the tumor reacts with its microenvironment. And we think that if we can block that interaction, we might be able to have a better anti-tumor effect. So the MET pathway is, is one of these key pathways that's involved. Because HGF, or hepatocyte growth factor, the ligand, um, is, is what activates CMET. But it's interesting because to activate um, HGF, you actually have to cleave it. So you have to break it in two. And so the, the molecule that cleaves HGF to make it activated to then activate the receptor is produced in the liver and then increased by the micro, tumor microenvironment. And so that activation, and this is one of the ways that tumors can over, um, uh, have overactivation of CMET, is to produce a lot of hepatocyte growth factor as, all, as well as produce the factor that cleaves HGF to activate it. Um, and so I think that You've got multiple mechanisms of activation. You've got a lot of crosstalk within the tumor and its microenvironment. And then on the cell surface itself, CMET seems to be a co-activator or co-receptor um, for the EGFR family. Um, uh, and then within VEGF, not necessarily VEGF on the tumor cells, but there seems to be, as David was alluding to, an angiogenesis play where increased levels of HGF correspond with increased levels of VEGF and, and back and forth. And so it seems to key up uh, angiogenesis within the tumor. So there's a loop that they keep turning each other on. So is, is HGF binding always required for CMET activation or can CMET be activated like through interaction with EGFR or other receptor tyrosine kinases? The only ligand that we know of for CMET is actually HGF. Uh, and so when you um, form that heterodimer, you do need HGF uh, to be able to activate the MET receptor. But then you can form the heterodimer with, for instance, the EGF receptor and cause um, increased signaling down the pathway. So um, let me just move to David for a second. So in, in non-small cell lung cancer, what is the typical situation for, for CMET? Is it amplification or overexpression or interaction with other receptor tyrosine kinases that seems to play the greatest oncogenic role in lung cancer? Well, I think it's fair to say that these data are still emerging. I mean, we're just now doing formal prospective studies uh, trying to understand these expression rates, uh, these mutation rates, amplification rates. I think historically we know that mutations are quite rare. So in non-small cell lung cancer, mutations are, are going to be well below 2%. Certainly, uh, I think some series suggest well below 1% of patients will have mutated tumors. Although I tell you this, and we recently have discovered uh, mutations in patients we've seen at our center. Um, expression by immunohistochemistry is a different story. Uh, and of course, that depends on, on how you score that. Is it any expression like the, the story with EGFR, or do you have to have a certain level of expression, so-called 3 plus or 2 plus, and a certain proportion of cells. So I think it depends how you define that. In some studies, uh, maybe we'll, I'm sure we're going to get into this, uh, in some studies that high expression is thought to be in at least half of patients with uh, non-small cell lung cancer. Wow. Um, in, in other studies, uh, if, if you're only looking at 1 plus expression, it might be the majority of patients with non-small cell lung cancer. When you look at amplification uh, by fish, that, that number is lower than IHC but higher than mutation. Some estimates uh, put that around 10%. Uh, it's, it, it might be a little bit lower, and I think in more modern series, suggesting maybe closer to 5%. I think what's clear is that this is not, this is not uh, present in every patient. Uh, we're not yet 
sure the best measure of this of this uh, receptor or this uh, this altered um, pathway for patients. So that's that's certainly a subject of ongoing investigation. And then we don't yet know what the cutoff is. What what is it that turns this into a targetable pathway for that particular patient? Do you have to have a certain mutation? Do you have to have a certain degree of amplification, or do you, or do you have to have a certain degree of expression for this drug to work well in, in, in that patient? And what, what, turns what turns it into the actual driver for the Yeah, I, I think, you know, certainly a lot of lessons have been learned from trastuzumab, Herceptin, and, and HER2, you know, with the 1, 2 plus, 3 plus scoring system and amplification uh, by FISH, which is now the standard. You know, is that going to be the similar, a similar story here? It doesn't look so far that it's going to be as easy as uh, mutation testing in, uh, for EGFR, you know, that will identify met mutations in 10 to 15 percent of patients with non-small cell lung cancer, and they'll just go on this pill, and that'll, that'll bind to the ATP binding pocket, and that'll, that'll shut down the receptor. It doesn't seem to be such uh, a simple story there. Very good. And how about in GI malignancies? Is it, is it more amplification or overexpression? And with the uh, hepatocyte growth factor being the ligand, um, what goes on in hepatocellular carcinoma? Is, is this going to be um, a real target for um, CMET-directed therapies? We're even a little bit behind non-small cell lung cancer within GI cancers trying to figure out is staining, a, does staining make a difference? Um, we've been using IHC because we're following the track of the lung cancer where it does ap appear that overexpression by, and as witnessed by IHC, seems to be um, correlated with impact of MET inhibitors uh, in treating cancer. Now, hepatocyte growth factor indeed uh, has become much more interesting. We saw results from a randomized phase two study recently of Tavantinib, which is a CMET inhibitor. It's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. We're not quite sure that it's purely a CMET inhibitor, but they tested it in patients with second-line hepatocellular cancer, randomizing them to um, tavantinib versus best supportive care and placebo. And we, see, we saw an improvement in time to progression as well as overall survival uh, within this small phase two study. And it seems to be even more pronounced in the patients that were designated CMET high by immunohistochemistry. So these were overexpressors. Correct. Very good. All right. Well, we'll we'll move on now, and uh, we'll bring a halt to this session, and then we'll go on and talk about uh, some of the early phase one, phase two clinical trials, and uh, and what the clinical data has shown so far. So, thanks for this session, and uh, we will be back to you uh, shortly and talk more about the actual clinical data uh, that is emerging with uh, CMET receptor targeted therapy. Thanks so much. <music>